Oh yes, Arun. Hello, Arun. Uh, sorry, I had to refresh the screen to be available. Uh, thankfully, it's back. Okay, so maybe you can start to share your screen using. Yes. Yes, we see your screen. So okay. you can start your presentation. Okay, you can hide the, the little toolbar by clicking on hide. Yes. Okay, the stage is yours. Thanks, Arno. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, sorry for the mini glitch before joining in. Uh, I hope everybody is staying safe wherever they are. Uh, it's still a virtual world everywhere. Uh, my talk today is uh, more on breaking up monoliths uh, and obviously laying them to rest by using uh, uh, any kind of APIs that, that could enable it. Uh, the talk is uh, fairly generic. I would say I have a couple of use cases that is something that we have implemented within our own ecosystem to say how we break our large scale monoliths to uh, newer ways of working. I hope you could take some inputs out of it and implement it uh, into your organization. The way I structure this presentation also is uh, uh, basically I'll go through some highlights of a monolith. Why do we use it? Uh, then obviously the strategies of breaking them up. Uh, there are two key strategies that we typically adopt. And then obviously the benefits that we have seen of doing this so that there are some key takeaways which motivates you to do the same. Uh, so quickly, thanks thanks for API Days to bring me in here. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Uh, we, as an organization, we are a European-based organization. Uh, I work for Amadeus. I'll, I'll have a slide uh, for it later. Um, and because we are a European-based organization, we are largely present in France, and I would have uh, preferred to be in person but it's, it's uh, interestingly a year where we do a lot of things virtually. A quick thing about me, uh, I'm a director of engineering. I take care of the uh, platform engineering, uh, which caters to DevOps systems. Uh, the two case studies that I have, uh, which gives you a view on the APIs that we consume, uh, will sort of give you a highlight uh, into the internal systems or tools that we use. This is less of uh, the APIs that we as a company make it available outside, but we also have things that we develop internally. So quick thing about Amadeus, uh, not spending too much of time. Uh, we are one of the largest providers for travel solutions or travel software for the uh, travel domain. Uh, in fact, most of the airlines consume us uh, both directly. Uh, I mean, you may not have heard, but the global distribution system, uh, which enables the um, the ticketing, boarding, and all, all the associated uh, activities on, on airline is supported by our uh, system. But one of the bit that I wanted to highlight is why APIs are important for us uh, is we do about 75,000 transactions per second when we are at peak. So obviously, these are not all UI-driven transactions. There are um, API-driven transactions. There are a lot of uh, other systems that consume us. But as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not a talk about what Amadeus provides externally, but this is for uh, the talk is more on uh, what platforms do we build internally to enable developers to develop fast, how, how have we broken up systems, and how we have embraced DevOps and automation in and around it. So let's let's quickly look at the enterprise evolution. When I see, when I put this, I'm assuming a lot of the organizations. Uh, including where you are part of, probably also have gone through this evolution. I mean, if you are a 30-year, 40-year-old company, uh, you probably have evolved through some of these processes and plans. Uh, we obviously started with monoliths. Um, there was conversations between two B2B systems, uh, and these monoliths were primarily on mainframes, so the scaling, etc., was uh, very different. Uh, these behind the scenes used let's say a TTY or an Edifact kind of messaging to talk between two systems. Then we slowly evolved into the monolithic uh, sort of a SOA based approach. Uh, you could call it still a monolith or you could call it like a very high or very large macro service. Uh, uh, 
along with some APIs where this extended not just between uh, with TDY and Edifax, but also with, let's say, SOAP and REST APIs. Uh, so this is sort of a mini evolution which happened in terms of using or consuming APIs. And then we obviously scale further. I don't know where we are going to get to, but let's see, uh, we're going uh, largely into the cloud ecosystem. Maybe we break it down even further. Uh, I would say uh, from an API evolution bit, uh, there has been a major evolution towards using APIs. Um, our consumers, the way we interact uh, with our business, with external business, all of them are through APIs, obviously. Uh, but uh, that is evolving very rapidly with uh, new systems coming in the airline domain. But obviously, this, there, there is scope for improvement, and uh, we will see how that can be put in practice. So obviously, when you go, uh, it's very easy to define what a monolith is. Uh, there are different definitions of it, uh, depending on uh, whom you're talking to. But it's not just about uh, the size of the code, right? I mean, if the application has 100 million lines of code, does it? qualify as a monolith, uh, but the way I classify it is sort of five different aspects. I think this is also classified by uh, the DevOps guru, uh, Martin Flower. Uh, Martin Flower. Uh, the, uh, the bit is either they are a monolith because the application itself is big, uh, larger lines of code, uh, then you could also look at it. There could be multiple components, but they are all connected behind with one single database. So the data is the interconnecting layer. So you could still call it a monolith. And there are other aspects like build and release. Do we have to package all of these products together and release them together? Uh, then are they backward compatible? Let's say a component A versus a component B. Are they interrelated? If they are interrelated, are they backward and forward compatible? And obviously, the last bit is monolithic thinking. Are, are we in a sort of a waterfall model uh, or, or the organization structures put in such a way where we are only looking at one way of working. I'm not saying if you are agile, we are not a monolith. If you are waterfall, you are only a monolith. But that's sort of a high level view that I wanted to share. And obviously, the next two slides, I'll run through it because that's not what is key to this conversation. But uh, the bit is there are benefits of monolith. It doesn't mean I am preaching with the use of APIs and breaking down of a monolith. I'm preaching to go into a, a microservice, macroservice, or a nano service, however you want to call it, or even serverless. Uh, but this is more about uh, me saying there are benefits of monolith. Uh, it was a way of working. Uh, it continues to be a way of working for many organizations. It needs to be looked at it as a thing. Is it something that solves my problem or not? Uh, and in that, in simple terms, we could look at it as saying, it makes developer or dev phase easy because it's one component. It's probably easier to test as well. I could call it an anti-pattern as well because once the application is so large, uh, do you think the testing is easier or more difficult? I'll probably classify it as easier. But that assumes that uh, there are good amount of test cases written. There are people who have the knowledge to do it, etc. And then obviously, it's easier to deploy. Yes, it's one big component. Just put the whole component together. Uh, it's easier to scale uh, in some ways if you have if you are running it under a load balancer, uh, just scale it horizontally and it would probably work, right? But on the same, on the contrary, when we look at it, at it from a problems of a monolith, there are certainly quite a few challenges. Um, it's, though I said it's easier to test, I also said it's easier to deploy. There are components or easier to test. I would put it the other way around also, depending on how complex the application is, how frequently the changes are happening on these applications. These could become complex as well, right? So I think this is more of a reading material. But so I'll just switch on to sort of more interesting case studies uh, in terms of when we decide on uh, breaking up a monolith. What do we really mean by breaking up a monolith? How do we decide it's is it a monolith uh, or a large application which is um, which qualifies to be broken, right? There could be three major categories where we see it from a technical angle. We uh, we want to break it technically so that we can be more agile, more nimble, more fast, etc. Uh, on the similar business side as well, we can look it at look at it as saying, uh, are there specific components which are business critical? So let's say I have a huge monolith, and we know over a period of time there is only one component which is going to evolve dramatically, and we need to continue investing. Uh, or we need to 
that the whole product itself has a lifetime of another eight years, 10 years, or even five years. And we want to make sure that it becomes easier for us to manage, uh, easier for us to, let's say, I mean, thinking of the cloud, easier for us to deploy to the cloud, etc. cetera. Uh, also, one of the key aspects on breaking monolith down is domain level expertise. I mean, uh, this is key because we need to understand whether I have the domain expertise which will continue to exist with me. If I break it down, will there be smaller areas of domains which is easier to manage and maintain? And obviously, the economic cost uh, when when I am transitioning to any old ways or working to new ways, there are stages where probably um, there is increase in the infrastructure cost. Am I able to absorb these during that process? And obviously, when I make some changes, will there be a revenue generation because of it? So let's look at uh, the two key strategies in which we break a monolith. And behind the scenes, obviously, all of these work when you have good API strategy behind the scenes, right? So I have, I see it as two independent ways of breaking down a monolith. One is strangling. I mean, it's pretty simple. You have a big monolith. You start consuming less of it over a period of time, uh, either by introducing new features. Let's say if I have a new feature to be added to the monolith, I build it as a microservice or another service which is separate from the monolith and try to connect each of them together. Uh, there could, and what logically means the load on the core monolith sort of reduces uh, and the backend is something uh, which reduces to two parts, one which is the new feature, one is the old feature. Similarly, you could split it by the reducing the load on it by taking off the front end components uh, and maybe also situations where you extract services saying, uh, let's say I have a transversal layer of let's say payments and I pull it out and create a new service which takes care of that. Breaking is uh, a big bang kind of uh, approach where you parallelly build a, a different product. Um, there could be variants of the strangling approach which could be used to the breaking approach as well. But you build sort of a parallel product and kill the old product and switch to the new product completely. But irrespective of either of these two approaches you use, there is a common governance model that you need to put in place. Uh, because once you have, let's say, microservices, once you have multiple services talking to each other, one of the core aspect is do we have a good API uh, governance model, a good language uh, or la let's say a common language model. Because when you're creating multiple services, it could mean that you have um, uh, one, one component written in Java, the other component written in Go, the third component written in Python, and talking between each other is extremely complicated. So, uh, so do we have all those policies put in place and that's very, very important. And obviously when you look at APIs, we also need to define what are the contracts which we need to do, uh, what should be the talking uh, agreements between two components and you build that. This is extremely important before you choose uh, to break up a monolith. So obviously the idealistic approach uh, is when we look at a monolith, you can break into smaller, uh, a big elephant broken down to smaller uh, elephants. Uh, is that the ideal scenario? Uh, it's the native. I mean, if you look at it, any uh, service oriented approach is very similar. Uh, and as I was sharing my prior experience of how the company itself has evolved. Um, oops, sorry, I think there's somebody who's trying to reach out to me. Just give me a second. Can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yes, Sarun, we can hear you. Okay, because I see quite a lot of chat saying it's uh, you no, can't. Okay. We hear you. You can go on, no problem. Okay. So uh, the uh, the bit is uh, there are various approaches. As I said, do we want to break it from a monolith to uh, smaller components, or do we break it into a real idealistic approach where each and every function is swappable? Let's say I build a service, and let's say. Uh, a third party vendor is providing very similar service. Can I plug out and plug in that approach uh, very easily? And do I have a common API layer, which everybody talks to? Do I have an API gateway, which is able to root all these, etc.? cetera? Uh, so this is where we need to look at it from an idealistic approach. So let's look at all the theory set aside. Uh, let's look at a couple of use cases, uh, which we have. I can give you a simple example. We had one monolithic application. This was in use. For uh, for about ten years, it it was it's a validation engine. Uh, to make it simple, think about it 
as an aspect saying any product that is being built, um, they need to be validated for um, performance tests and any kind of operational checks, etc. And this does about 18 million validations a day. So it's a very large component. Uh, it was not API based. You call this component and then it would deliver. So it's and then we also have to evolve this big component in it's almost like changing the engine of an aeroplane when the aeroplane is flying. Uh, Every day we continue to do releases when we are doing about 18, 000, 18 million validations. It doesn't mean we can have a parallel component which I continue to build and there's a one day switch. There are uh, uh, hundreds of applications who are trying to consume it, which basically means I need to change uh, in, in a particular process. So let's look at how this evolution eventually happened. Right? Uh, I won't get into the details because the architecture is very, uh, I've just put a very simple representation of it. Uh, but let's look at how the whole process went through for us. Um, we took a look at the monolith. Obviously, we embrace the monolith, saying the monolith exists. We need to modify it. We start identifying what are the various components, where are the scenes, which are things that can be broken down. And obviously, the biggest thing that we need to look at is the database aspect of it, right? Uh, there was a big product. There was a big database which that product was supporting. There were uh, let's say 200 kinds of validations which was being done. And when I say 200 kinds of validations, let's look at it as 200 different business case or business flows. Uh, and that had different components to deal with. Uh, the database had to be separated out. Uh, one thing which we look at it as an organizational journey, the journey is hard. I mean, there are uh, there there is resistance which is seen at multiple levels to say, why should we go through this whole journey? Why is it important? Uh, generating use cases is always difficult. Uh, trying to build value is very difficult. But and again, along with that, the organizational structures are usually created around the tools that you have. And changing a tool means you change the organizational structure. And that's very important because uh, you need to be aware that these are kind of resistance that you will eventually see. So the first, obviously, for this approach, the validation engine that I was explaining, uh, we started identifying what are the different components that we could break, uh, what are the components we could pull out to make the monolith a little light. Uh, we obviously start small. Uh, we eliminated or we separated out the UI component. Uh, all the UI requests started flowing through this new component or the UI component that we, we built. All the existing backend requests were still going into the monolith. So uh, any kind of user transfer, the existing applications did not stop working, but we basically said there's a new UI component now uh, and any kind of new uh, management that needs to be done goes through this UI component. Uh, obviously, this is important. What also the case it gets into once we start building, once we start putting up the APIs, um, obviously the security of this whole product, the, the surfacial area of the security uh, is increased. So we need to look at security of the APIs, uh, the components that we are breaking down in the monolith, how do we secure it, etc. So these are some things that you need to look at. When we obviously extend it further, uh, we are also looking at uh, a long term vision of simplifying the whole thing. Uh, we do not want to create a mesh of uh, mess and a mesh of uh, multiple components, let's say 300 different components, which become so small and uh, we can't obviously break down the team into smaller components. And we also start building new functionalities in the monolith because the monolith has not really stopped evolving. We still have to evolve it. Uh, we start putting new functionalities as a separate component if possible, but if not, if introduced in the monolith, we look at feature flags and how these could be turned on and off uh, whenever this needs to be developed. Going a little further, which is equally important, uh, if you noticed earlier, there was everything rooted through, uh, some parts rooted through the UI, some part rooted through the backend. Now we change the monolith to a component which only it works as a backend. Uh, we start building APIs which could be consumed. This is a very key phase of making a transition of breaking down a monolith is trying to make these o APIs open within the organization, within the ecosystem, open source, inner source, etc., uh, which logically enables um, the evolution on the backend to reduce, but 
uh, or rather evolution on the monolith to reduce but to increase on the backend side so let's say i request for a feature on the legacy product i basically say okay these are your high level apis please consume it build a product and give it to us so that we can plug it into the backend and that's how it will get served over a period of time what this enables obviously is it enables uh, the fast track usage of the apis um, and again behind the scenes it enables you to run hackathons uh multiple inner sourcing models if you are a, if you are a product which is open to open to the consumers i mean I, as i was giving an example of an internal product but if it's open to the consumers you could probably look at uh open sourcing it and expecting people to build as build the back backend as components and uh, probably say uh, how this could be evolved uh, in that journey the next stage obviously is creating the complete separate component and this is what we did uh, the backend exists now you create a separate component uh, the we call it one of the components that we pulled out is the parser component uh, it had its own db uh, and when you're looking at any kind of parsing let's say we were getting some messages some data which needed to be parsed instead of it being distributed uh, distributed at a monolithic layer we created a horizontal or a microservice which would parse and pass back the data to the uh, monolith and this is the initial stage of breaking down or identifying the seam and creating components out of it and this can be extended to any level we still don't route request to the parser uh, to the new component directly through the ui it's the flow is still from the ui to the back end to the parser uh, and the data side only the new data is sort of going into the database the old data is still in the uh, core component of the data frame and this is where we start implementing the api design shifting left of the apis as much as possible uh, breaking down the data components etc what's more important as as we flow through this the next is obviously the uh, the we build apis on the parser uh, which is the component that i basically mentioned uh, this is also a time where we start looking at how do we split the uh, database uh, push the data from the database which is the core major database into the smaller databases so it was not only microservices of a component but also data being spread across multiple components aided by apis in this in this side this is where the switch starts happening uh, moving along uh, we start directing the traffic to the backend uh, instead of the 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 new component itself taking uh, which which i highlighted here uh, the earlier phase was where the ui uh, was right uh, directing it to the backend uh, and the backend sending the api request to the parser uh, we obviously put in sort of a gateway in place where it switches and swaps between the old backend and the new backend depending on where or which uh, component that it needs to hit uh, this is a stage where it's it gets a little tricky because this is a phase where you're sort of scaling up both old and the new uh, you're scaling down the old and scaling up the new so you at a point of time you might have double the infrastructure double the operations uh, and then you have not evolved your old legacy product quite well so there could be multiple holes in it so you need to keep uh, keep the work around going as much as possible uh, you are also looking at loads uh, in terms of how do we direct let's say a particular set of a traffic onto the old backend particular set of the traffic to the new backend this is sort of the starting of the switch but when we look at the next phase which is what is uh, important this is where the new component starts becoming an independent co component it's it's sort of an autonomous service now uh, you have in this phase if you can see my mouse uh, there is the data from the database which is the primary database into the parser new database there is one time of transfer of data which we push and with respect to the new components that we have that starts getting request directly obviously this is also a phase where we open up all the apis we say there is a completely new component which can be used directly so this is the way you can consume uh, there are backward and forward uh, backward compatible applications so your some of the applications who take time to migrate or time to start using the new component or the api gateway itself could be used to say how do i automatically even with the old api request could i change it to the new request how easy can i make it for consumers to start using uh the uh, new components that we have built uh the key the key aspect here obviously is resist the uh, uh urge to move back to the monolith 
uh, there will be challenges. There will be challenges in terms of scaling, management, etc. Don't move there. Uh, then there is obviously this is a phase where obviously through the process you have implemented DevOps and agile ways of working. But this is a phase where it really is seen. Any problem, try to move forward. Don't try to move back to the old ways of working because breaking is always difficult and moving forward is very important. So this is sort of the use case where I looked at it from a point of view of uh, changing the uh, process in a slow way. Then obviously there is another uh, tool that we had internally where it was a big monolith. Uh, we were looking at moving that application to the cloud. Uh, and we said, can we break it down? Uh, we built a completely parallel product, which did almost 80% of the use cases. Then there was a one day switch to say anyone who is using in the old ways, continue to use the old tool. Anyone who has switched to the cloud, start using this new, new tool, right? So this is where sort of uh, you have APIs built to get changes. This is a tool which is which does deployments for all products within, within our organization. And this is completely UI based, uh, API based. There is absolutely no UI itself. I mean, we have almost eliminated the UI component and all consumers can just use the product with APIs. Uh, so this is sort of the big bang approach that we need to select. I have to interrupt you. We are running out of time and I even give you a few minutes uh, above because there were to okay. put you on Gregory's side. So thank you very much. There is uh, thank you. There are some questions on the chat. I hope that you can answer to them. And uh, sure. for all attendees, you can still interact with uh, Arun. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much.